Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. In this case, these founders and how they got to $20 million in sales in such a short period of time. We're talking to Brittany and Kim Zinpak. Their company Zinpak was founded in 2011 by Brittany Hodak and Kim Kaup, who met while working at a New York City ad agency. Welcome, guys. Hi, thanks for having us. Now, your fans have spent more than $20 million on Zine Packs, and your company has distributed more than 2.5 million of them in 19 countries, and they work with dozens of top entertainers and brands, including Kiss, Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, American Idol, many more, and you've even partnered with Walmart for greater distribution. So welcome, and thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. Thanks. So give us an example of what is in a zine pack for people who don't know. Sure. So a zine pack is an elevated form of entertainment for what we lovingly refer to as super fans. So for instance, this is the zine pack that just came out for Toby Keith. And so a typical Toby Keith release would just be a CD in a jewel case. So a fan would, would have the CD and you know maybe a little booklet and that's about it. So the zine pack configuration has the CD, but it's packaged in a magazine that's anywhere from 60 to 100 pages long that has exclusive wow. interviews and photos and all kinds of really great content and then some sort of collectible memorabilia. So the collectible merchandise in the Toby Keith one is coasters and it changes from release to release. Uh, our Katy Perry release had about six different merchandise items inside of it. So with each package, we really try to identify what it is that super fans of an artist will love and then create that experience for them. Yeah, and your brands, you have, these people have tons of super fans. And I'm curious, so how do you get them to agree to you know, do a zine pack? And then on top of it, that's a pretty extensive magazine. Then they're spending time with interviews and things like that. How do you get in front of them? Absolutely. We've been really fortunate that a lot of celebrities in the past year, year and a half have come to us. Really? Um, it's a very small industry. So when Taylor Swift sees that Justin Bieber got one, then she wants one. And when Katy Perry sees that Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift want one, then she has one. So it's, um, mm -hmm. it's a very small circle, very much like you know, high school, that it, once one trend starts, kind of yeah. everybody hops on board. So we've been very fortunate to be that trend. Yeah. I, when you say that, I immediately want to ask about 10 questions about who, you know, who the first one was, because, you know, getting that first person on board before everyone else sees it is tough. But I want to I start from early on and, you know, where you grew up and what influenced your entrepreneurial journey. But I like to include one fun fact. And fun fact so they get to know you on a more of a personal level. Brittany, you're a Guinness Book of World Record holder. Yes. Tell us yes, about that. Yeah, That's one of the titles that I'm most proud to have. When I was in college, several of my friends and I decided that we wanted to be world record holders. So we uh, quickly realized that we lacked the physical capability to you know, grow the longest fingernails or jump the highest or any of the typical things that you think of when you think of world records. So we created the world's largest Christmas stocking and we created a stocking that was a little over 54 feet tall and 26 feet from heel to toe and we filled it up with about 13,000 toys that have been donated by wow. various people and then donated those to children in need across our area. That's amazing. How do you get 13,000 toys in a stocking? A lot of hustle and <laughs> a lot of engineering. Yeah. Luckily, one of, my good friend, Brad, one of my good friends, Brad, was an engineering major, and he rigged up this um, portable thing that we use because the stocking itself, just the empty material, weighed over 100 pounds. That's crazy. It was crazy. So uh, we got to the point when we were making it, it was so large, we couldn't even put it all in one place anymore. We started making it on the racquetball court and then we outgrew the racquetball court and we had to do it on the football practice field. And wow. it got very big, very fast. That's huge. And Kim, your fun fact is you were you went to the Junior Olympics for volleyball. So do you still play volleyball or does your work-life balance not allow you to do that? <laughs> I don't play anymore, but I played for about 12 years and it was so much fun. And I think that definitely helped in terms of teamwork and kind of building the entrepreneurial spirit, for sure. So where did each of you grow up, and what was this something that influenced you early on? I grew up in Roland, Oklahoma, and I was 
very influenced by my family, in particular my father's love of music. So music was always an important part of my life. And when I was 16 years old, we got to go job shadow for a day at a place that we wanted to work, and I chose the local radio station. Hmm. And when I was there, I said, you guys have got to give me a job. I'll do anything. I have to work here. And they said, okay, well, we need a mascot, so you can be our new radio station mascot. So my first job was as Sting the Bee, the giant bumblebee mascot that would go out and do rodeos and carnivals and car lot remotes and uh, gradually worked my way up to various other jobs in the entertainment industry. Seems to be in shape to do that. I mean, what do they, do they make you do push-ups or what do they make you do when yep. you're running around the rodeo? It was a little bit of uh, physicality for sure of being able to, to run. And the thing that was always the, the hardest for me was every time that there were state fairs, I would have to ride the rides. And it was very hard to not get motion sickness inside of a giant mascot head. Right. So I would be on these you know crazy roller coasters and rides and trying to keep the costume on and the head on and not, you know, go crazy or pass out so i'm gonna have to look for a picture experience. online of that uh, if i can find one um oh i can hook you up okay I good interesting. yeah i want to i want to include one of those and uh, then uh kim what about you where did yeah, you grow I grew up with a love of publications uh, ever since i was a little girl i used to pour over my mother's magazines and vogue and vanity fair and all the great um kind of books that would come to the house and i just loved them. So my internships all throughout college um, were at major publications here in New York um, at Timing specifically. So I just fell in love with publishing at a young age and I was one of those kids in high school that while well, everyone else was trying to figure out what they wanted to do, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Did you know that you wanted to have your own business or were you just, it just kind of led in that direction? No, I mean I definitely never planned on it. I think the, the love that we have for Zine Pack was really born out of frustration uh, with our with our current situations and where we were and where we had come from and you know when we started the company in 2011 it was you know we're just coming out of the recession and a lot of budget cuts a lot of doom and gloom and really just wanted to be a part of the change. So what do you remember about that time? What was a breaking point that you just had to do this? I think a breaking point for us was feeling like we just didn't have a voice at the ad agency where we work. Neither of us had a background in advertising. I had been working at record companies, Kim had been working in publishing, and we just happened to find our way to advertising. And we thought, here's this amazing forum for us to share ideas and do these great things. And we didn't realize that there is a huge, huge, huge divide still at some ad agencies between what they call the creative team and the account team. And we were on the account team, which meant we weren't supposed to have ideas and contribute these you know, thoughts and ideas to, to programs. We were just supposed to execute them. So nobody would listen to our ideas. and Nobody would, would take us seriously when we said we have this really great idea for this product that you know, we think can really revolutionize physical entertainment. So finally, after our you know, efforts falling on deaf ears, we said, why don't we just do this ourselves? Maybe we can just Maybe we can just have a company and, and make this happen. And so our first call was to Walmart. And we said, we have this idea for this product. We think it would be really great. We really want to give it a shot. Would you be willing to carry this in your stores if we created it? And they hmm. said yes. And that was all we needed. We quit our jobs and we started the company. So the first call you make is to Walmart, right? So and they said yes, which was great. We so didn't who do you even call Walmart? I mean, it's not like you can go to walmart.com and look up a, a you know, name of a person. How'd you find the person who's actually in charge of this and get through to them and you know get your questions answered? So luckily when I worked at the record company that I was at for three and a half years, I was in charge of all of the retail marketing. So it was my job to set up marketing programs and come up with exciting ideas to to help fans get excited about music. So I stayed in touch with all of my accounts when I left my job in music to go work in advertising. So it was easy to, to pick up the phone and call an old friends. Yeah, so what if someone's reaching out to a big retailer like 7-Eleven, Walmart, you know, whatever it is, what's something they should watch out for? You should definitely watch out about making it all about you. The people who are tasked with doing buying and marketing for large corporations, understandably, they, they care about their corporations. They don't care about you and your business and your company and what you want to do. So you've got to lead with a benefit and you've got to tell that retailer how you're going to help make something better or solve a problem that they have. 
So saying, I'm going to create something that nobody can get except in your stores, and it's going to enhance whatever experience for your shoppers. That's how you've got to frame the conversation. So what do you think it was in that first conversation where you got a yes? What did you tell them? I think that they really saw the passion that we had and this idea of, you know, People have been talking for years about how the music industry is declining and people are getting music online, you know, they're streaming it digitally or mm. they're or they're downloading it, but there isn't there isn't a decrease in desire for music. Fans aren't connecting less with the bands that they love. They're just doing it in a different way. So we said in order for somebody to instead of downloading it, get in their car, drive to the store, spend money on something physical, unwrap it, take it home, put it in a CD player, there's got to be a win there. You can't just continue to provide exactly what somebody could get online right. in a physical format. You've got to come up with a way to make it collectible and engaging and mm -hmm. fun. And that was really the idea that drove the creation of Zine Pack. So was that original idea, what you thought, what you told them, was that what actually came to be or did it, did it change, Kim? Did you guys go back and forth and, and change it before it went to market? Um, if you look at our first Zine Packs and, and what we've done now, it's... It's generally the same, but we feel like we've made a lot of improvements. Um, some of them coming from fans themselves who tweeted at us and asked for us to change things. Yeah. Or so what did they tell you? What was the feedback you were getting? Uh, we got feedback once from someone who um, had a recommendation about the we have uh, they're called die cuts inside our packages, and um, this one looks like a bottle. Um, but we had been doing them horizontally instead of vertically and someone had wrote to us and said I think it would be awesome if you and we had only done a couple at this time and he said I think it'd be awesome if you did it um, vertically and we said you got it and so our next release we had it come out and he was super stoked and we love hearing from fans and any kind of cool ideas that they have for us yeah, and I mean, then it, go ahead the thought behind that was when we had it horizontally, when you turned the package upside down, it would fall out. So he said, you know, I always drop my CDs when I take my zine pack to my car with me yeah. because I pick it up the wrong direction. So, um, you know, feedback like that has really helped us make the products better. Yeah. So what other feedback, was there any feedback that you got that, you know, because you get a lot of feedback and you can't, you know, do everything. Yeah. What's something that maybe, was there something that you resisted at first, but then you found more people were saying it? Hmm. You know, uh, one thing that we've really worked hard to integrate um, is the, this idea of letting fans contribute to the conversation mm -hmm. in the zine pack. So um, a lot of times these come together on, under very quick timelines. So there isn't time to solicit questions from the fans or right. have them help us create it. But we've really been, we hear that feedback all the time. So we've really been working to implement that. And on our Katy Perry release that came out last month, for instance, we let fans ask questions on Katie's Facebook page and on the Walmart Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And we incorporated about a dozen of those questions from fans all over the world into the finished book. And on our Duck the Halls release, which is the Christmas album from the family behind Duck Dynasty, we actually let fans choose the cover for that. So mm -hmm. we gave them three different options and we let them vote on the one that they liked the best. And we're trying to do more and more things like that because that is the number one thing we hear from fans is we love the finished product, but how do we get to participate before the project yeah. is done? So we're actually launching a Zine Pack app in January that nice. people will be able to download and they'll be able to give us suggestions about our products before they come out to help us influence what we what we work on. Yeah, I love that because now they're helping you create it and they almost feel ownership you know, over it and they're gonna love it even more because they're contributing to it. That's, that's really smart. Now, I wanna know how you guys met and also, um, how you decided that you were good to partner up together? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really ordinary story in that um, we met at an ad agency. It's a very small activation agency. They do events for brands. And um, we just decided, again, going back to what Brittany said about the echoing frustrations with the um, creative and account side that we were at, um, really decided that it would be best to leave the company and we got along really well and we had complementary skills and thought it would be a great idea to try try a swing at the company and I'm sure you've read um, we never 
intended for it to fail, but we also never intended it for it to succeed as quickly as it has. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people at the, the company weren't so happy, and you probably got along with number. You both seem like nice people. You got along with that, you know most people there. So, what was it about Brittany that you saw? I want to partner up with this person because it's a big decision to make. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we tell people all the time it's it's like a marriage. You you're yeah. you have a life partner, um, and it really you have to make sure that you can trust that person. You have to make sure that that person is creative and they work the same have the same work ethic as you do and there are a lot of qualities um, just like you would find if you were dating someone or are gonna marry someone that all of those qualities have to be in place or, or else you don't have a good match at all and, and fortunately for us we, we had a lot of um, compatible traits yeah I mean because I also hear from founders that you know maybe they made a wrong decision or you know I'm not sure I'm looking for a founder I'm not sure what to look for you know, what did you see, Brittany and Kim, that you're like, this is the person I want to partner up with in this huge project? Well, as Kim said, we had really complimentary backgrounds. My, I, I had always loved publishing, but I never had a job in publishing. I actually tried to get internships in college at Rolling Stone and Spin and lots of magazines, and nobody ever would give me an internship, so I always worked at labels. So I didn't know anything about the publishing world. And Kim had always worked in publishing, and she loved music. And she didn't know anything about the music industry other than you know what she knew as a fan. So we felt like this product that so perfectly was combining aspects of the publishing world and aspects of the music world, we, we were just sort of perfectly aligned to, to have this baby together that is Zine Pack. Yeah, yeah. So I want to hear about a hard point. What's a tough point? Maybe a decision that you didn't agree on or how you come to an agreement if you don't agree. Besides, you know, like some people will have a certain method that they do. What do you guys do? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's different for different sets of people. I think what really helps for us is we have an amazing business coach. Um, some people like that. Some people don't. We're, we're fans. We think it's great. Mm -hmm. And having somebody who's outside of the day-to-day, -day, who's outside in terms of like connections to either one of us, really helps us put in perspective, you know, decisions or if we're not agreeing about something, you know, sometimes she doesn't agree with either one of us um, and she thinks we're both wrong. So um, it's really helpful. What was one of those situations? Do you remember one? <laughs> that? Um, she helps us with all the time and, and like this is our first company so we get things wrong all the time and she's great and has had all this experience with previous mm -hmm. Companies, so we we talked to her last week about employee evaluations and giving us advice on how to do those and you know the methods that work best. So in terms of solving problems and really looking at our company in the best way possible, I think a business coach for us has been an amazing solution to that. So what did she tell you to do? She helps us with everything all the time. Um, one of the one of the times where she was probably most uh, critically important was when we were scaling the company. So for the first two years of Zine Pack, it was just the two of us, and we had an amazing creative director who was a freelancer, and that was it. And we said, we know we need help. We know we've got to build the staff, but we didn't know how to do it or where to start. So she really helped us come up with a structure of how to grow the company, what was most important, quickest how things would grow and scale. And so since February, we've hired 10 employees. And um, our coach, Marla, has been incredibly instrumental in helping make sure that all of those people come on at the right time and that we have the right tools in place to train them and make them feel like they can you know, immediately contribute to the team on day one. I mean, how did you, it was just the two of you, were you not sleeping? I mean, how did you, you had a deal with Walmart, how did you fulfill all that? It was crazy, we tell people all the time, um, if, if we could go back and change one thing, it would be hiring help sooner. In 2011, our first year, we had six releases that came out. And in 2012, we had 24 releases. Wow. And seven of them happened on the same day. And it was crazy. We didn't have systems in place to scale. We didn't have employees. And so we really, we learned a lot from that experience. 
and we said we're going to take time to figure out how to scale a company. We've we've moved past the proof of concept phase. You know, we've sold two million of these things. We know right. that people want to buy them, and we know that we can we can make this work as a business model. Now we've got to fix the internal structure. And so we took off some time at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, and all we did was work on our internal infrastructure. So mm -hmm. getting systems in place and figuring out how to manage projects and work on things simultaneously. And that's what led to us hiring on all of our team members and what we think has been the right order. So you have huge growth early on. How did you get your first initial person on board? Well, I'll let you take that one because that's an easy one. Um, so our very first client was Kidspop, which is the largest music brand for children in the United States. And um, my husband happens to be the head of sales at the record company. So he was hearing the pitch for a while at home before he said, okay, you can come in and, and pitch the rest of my company and maybe mm -hmm. we can get this done. And so uh, we worked with Kidspot for our first release and we've worked with them three times since then. And we actually have our fourth Kidspot release that'll be coming out in stores in January for their Kidspot 25 mm -hmm. record. So we're really excited about that one. Um, they've been an amazing part of, of the company as we've grown and they've always been big supporters of ours and we're excited to uh, always do new and different things with them. So how many times did you have to pitch him before he took it to the, the team? You know... Unless, until he sleeps on the couch. I think it, was, it, it, it wasn't so much pitching, but I mean, he's incredibly supportive and yeah. he's been, uh, a huge help as we've grown the company. I think it was more deciding that we were actually going to do it because he heard me talking about it for a while of, you know, what if we started this and what if we did the company and what if Kim and I really did this for sure? And he said, you know, if you're going to do it, do it. And if you're really going to do it, then let's talk about it and see what, it, what we can do to help. So that was our first project. And then our second project for the Academy of Country Music Awards came out just a couple of months later and we're working with the ACM um, our project that comes out in March this year will be the fourth time that we worked with them so that's another amazing partner that's been um, you know a huge part of our company because they've been a constant as we've grown yeah so after kids Bob how did you get the second customer Walmart helped us land the Academy of Country and Music um, we had sold the idea into Walmart they were excited about the kids Bob release and they said okay so what's next and we said, well, what if we do a project for the Academy of Country Music Awards? And they said, okay, great. And we said, okay, good. We're glad you like that idea because we don't know anyone there. So, you're so why'd you choose them? Why'd you well, choose that? I'm a huge country music fan and Kim loves it as well. And we knew that that would be a great way to introduce ourselves to a lot of superstars. So, uh, for instance, many of, the, many of the artists that were on that first ACM zine pack, like Taylor Swift, and um, Toby Keith and George Strait, all people that we met through that project have gone on to do their own team packs with us. So for us, it was kind of an introduction to the mm -hmm. country space. So, I mean, those, those look very labor intensive. How did you do the first one? A lot of labor. <laughs> A lot of labor. And I think we've perfected the process as we've gone on over the last two and a half years. And We've definitely come down to more of a science of, of how to put them together. It's it's just like baking apple pie, you know. After enough time, it just gets to be where you realize how to do it really well. Um, so they've gotten less and less labor intensive, only because we keep improving our processes more and more. What should people watch out for? You know, pitfalls when you you know creating a physical product. What did, what did you run up against? One thing to be really conscious of is your inventory. So in creating a physical product, uh, it costs a lot of money because you have to you have to pay for a lot of stuff. So one thing that's been really helpful to us is having a charge card. We we didn't know what a charge card was um, for the first year that we ran this company, and we were we were putting things on seven or eight different credit cards and moving balances around and saying, okay, we know we've got to pay this vendor on the 15th, so we really really hope that check from the client comes in on the 14th. And when we, when we heard about charge cards and how they have a much larger balance capacity and you pay them off after 60 or 90 days instead of over time, we said, wow, that sounds like something we need. And so now we have a few different charge cards with American Express that have helped us grow our spending capacity from, you know, maybe $100,000 to upwards of a million dollars. So that allows us to work on many more projects at the same time and be able to 
to really spread around the the love that we're, we're giving to fans. So we don't have to make the choice between working on a country project or working on a rock project. We have the, the financial capacity to work on both of those at the same time. Were there any physical you know issues with the physical product that you had to you know factor in? Yeah, the, the quality control is something that if you're going to make a physical product, you just have to be aware of. And it's, and it's not something that you fix once and kind of forget about. Um, it's constant. You know, you're constantly looking at, you know, new coatings or new machinery or new um, this and that. And you really have to keep an eye on the quality to make sure it's up to your standards, but then the quality of how to improve it. And how to always be coming up with something that's bigger and better and faster. I mean, we also uh, made the decision to keep all of our vendors in the United States. So we said that you know we want to work with the best vendors in the world, and for for us that means working with U.S. based partners. So um, everybody that we work with is based here in the U.S. We have about 50 different partners that make everything from you know patches to keychains to ornaments to air fresheners. So we're working with a lot of different people to to create these products. Yeah, because I can imagine if you're creating thousands and thousands of these, if there's one error, you either just ship it as is or you have to redo the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a lot of pressure. So you, did you run up against that, that you had to make that decision yet? Or is it the quality control been there where you, you know, kind of avoided it? Luckily, we've had really good quality control, and now we have a production manager who keeps a very critical eye on things like that. But there, you know, you don't always find the right vendor the first time, and it took us it took us a few zine packs to to find a vendor that was really a partner and not not a vendor. So you know, if you are making a physical product, just know that you never have to. You know, you should date the people before you marry them in terms of. Don't sign a four-year deal with a vendor the first time you work with them. Make sure that they care about your product as much as you do and can constantly work to improve their processes and make things more efficient for you. What are some of the challenges that you face day-to-day on running a, you know, a big business? There are lots of challenges. I think for us, um, there's two sets of challenges. There's everything business-related, so growing, our CPA, our lawyer, that sort of kind of business angle. And then because we have a creative product, it's the creative angle of how do we partner with somebody who can print and glow in the dark and how do we, you know, how do we constantly stay or how do we build an app in a, in a timely fashion? It's constantly trying to push ourselves. So the problems kind of come twofold and I think for us it's it's categorizing where a problem lives and then um, as Bernie said trying to solve those problems in the right order. So you know first you need to come up with a system that works before you realize what two people you need to hire next. Um, so a lot of times when people think that problems are individual problems, a lot of times they're tied together um, and they're a lot more connected than, than people realize. Yeah. Now, Brittany, I, I asked you a question before we started and you gave me an interesting brief answer. I want you to expand on this. And you know, what was some, I asked, like to ask, what was something you did to try and make money that you thought would work, but it failed miserably. So people kind of see in their business, you know, maybe what some things they should avoid or what they should do. Yeah. So when we were talking before, I said that, you know, we haven't really run across that yet. Because we've been, the, the one thing that I think we learned from the, the advertising agency experience that we had that served us well is you should have other people pay for your ideas. Um, you should sell in an idea to someone before you spend money to figure out whether or not somebody wants to buy it. So we've really put a lot of the effort on pitching things and selling things in up front so that there aren't any big surprises. We're not going to spend a million dollars to build something and say, Oh, we hope some somebody wants to buy it. We hope they want to do it. We've been able to make really great comps and compelling stories, and you know, show market research and consumer data to get people on board with ideas before we move forward with them. Right. So, for example, we're working on an app to power augmented reality experiences for our Zine Pack products. 
that's something that we wanted to do for a while, but we said we're not going to take on that financial commitment until we line up some clients who say that they want to take advantage of that. So now that we have three or four clients that have said, I absolutely want that included in my zine pack, it makes financial sense for us to, to make that investment because we know that we'll be able to recoup it. Yeah, I, I wanted you to make that distinction because it's not that you haven't failed, it's just you put it out to the marketplace before you spend all the time, energy, and money you know, working on it, and if it's not getting the traction, or you don't have actual, you know, clients from it, then you just kill it and go on to something that will, right? So I don't want people to think, oh, everything they do just works. You actually have a method behind the things that you launch, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's augmented reality? So I can actually show you. I don't know how well it's gonna it's gonna work over Skype, but augmented reality is using a phone or tablet to power something from a printed page that isn't there in real life. So for instance, this is a project that we did for Selene Gomez's fan club. Mm -hmm. And this one is powered by a blip through, uh, a, an app called Blipper. And with this experience, let's turn the, the volume on, you can scan this page with the phone. And on the smartphone, you, get, you see how now there's something different on the phone. There's that pop up there bonus. telling you to touch it. So when you touch it, it powers this. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining the scene. My hmm. fans gave the absolute world to me, so I created the special scene pack just for you guys. It'll include sneak peeks to my Stars Dance album, my tour, my fashion, my movie projects, and much more. And the best part hmm. is you can't get it anywhere else. That's pretty cool. So I hope to see you guys on the road. Get yeah, so you can do so it's much great stuff. Technology. Reality. Yeah, you can um, you can have anything come to life. So you can have photo galleries, you can have interviews, you can have videos like you just saw with Selena, and you can do really fun photo booth, uh, virtual photo booths where you can take your picture with a celebrity or put your face on the cover mm -hmm. of a magazine. So we're working to integrate all of this into our future zine packs, and we know from the fan response to a couple of the ones that we've done using outside vendors that fans love this type of interaction. So now we're really excited to be able to to bring this in and offer it as part of the overall zine pack experience. I mean, obviously you love the music industry. What's a fun celebrity story that you had to, you got to experience because this is your company? There's so many of them. Yeah, we've had a lot of great opportunities to, to meet and hang out and um, go see great performances by some of the people we work with. I think one event that we look forward to going to every year is the Academy of Country Music Awards um, ceremony. It, it happens in Vegas, which is always a fun place to go and any excuse to visit Vegas and, and hang out with um, the people that we work with year round in a really relaxed, fun setting that isn't necessarily New York or Nashville or LA. Um, it's great, it's great fun and we look forward to it every year. So who have you met that you just pinched yourself when you were actually talking to them? Gosh, there have been so many. Uh, Kiss was one of the ones that I was really excited to work with because I grew up as a huge Kiss fan. So getting to work really closely with um, you know, all the guys in the band to put it together was, was really special. And everybody was really involved, but, but Paul and Gene especially were very involved in the creation of the piece, which was great. We actually dressed up as our favorite zine pack characters for Halloween, everyone in the office. And I came dressed as Tommy Thayer from Kiss to uh, to show the, the love for that project. So nice. that was a very special place in my heart. So were there any, um, can you think of any meetings that you got with actual, you know, the entertainers that they weren't so easy? I mean, you called Walmart, you had connections with them, you know, your husband had connections. Um, what was one that you remember just going back and forth and you know being persistent over um, that's that's a couple of them yes. um, I think one that was um, really iffy for us but one that we really wanted and pushed for um, was the Beach Boys when they came back for their 50th anniversary tour and kind of reunion there were a lot of questions in the industry of were they gonna come back were they not gonna come back you know is Brian Wilson gonna you know, come back or is he going to pull out a week before the album comes out? So we really wanted that project. We knew it was an iconic band and a really kind of stake in the ground for us in terms of real legends that we had been able to work with. And we were fortunate enough that the project ended up sticking, but there was a lot of back and forth with that one. So what did you do? Did you, was that back and forth call that you have to fly and see them or what was the toughest part about that? 
Yeah, it was a lot of calls and emails to make it happen. And then we, you know, we ended up saying, you know what, we're going to just go to L.A. and hopefully we can get a meeting. So while we were in L.A., they said, oh, OK, it's, it's going to happen. And, you know, it's a shame you're not in L.A. because you could just meet with the band tomorrow. And we said, oh, we are in L.A. Perfect. How did that happen? What a coincidence. Um, so we, we got to interview the band at, at the Capitol Towers. And, you know, it was it was just incredible. And. We got a lot of business advice from them. That's another thing about being young that we we have the chance to, to interact with these iconic people and oftentimes they have advice for us. So it was really fun to, to hear business advice from the Beach Boys. So I don't know if you have any for this. It seems like it's almost been this trajectory, but what's been a low point? Well, there are always hard points. I think a low point for us is, um, you know, work-life balance and Sometimes it's hard to miss the birthday parties or it's hard not to, you know, go to your friend's baby shower. Um, it's a definite choice and it's one that's really hard to make for us sometimes. And But at the same time, obviously, we find this so rewarding that, you know, it's it's been a lot of compromise on our friends and family as well. So we've been really fortunate to have people around us that really understand kind of what we do and, and we're at the mercy of our schedules sometimes. Yeah, I ask because that's the real story. I mean, you're starting a big company. It was the two of you to begin with. And, you know, most people think, oh, yeah, they just, you know, they check out at six. That's not the case. What was something painful that you had to miss out on because of you were growing the company? Oh, man. Um, I was just, I wrote an article last week um, for Forbes. My mother, I think it was last Christmas, caught me under the dinner table at Christmas Eve uh, emailing. <laughs> Because she was just, you know, and, and scolded me, she got over it. But, you know, it's hard, and I think it's hard when, when your family, you, you don't want to disappoint them, and you want them to always be happy and know that you love them, and to know that you can't always be there for everything, or even when you are there, you know, your mind might be somewhere else on something that has to get done. So, and, and Brittany has a husband, I have a boyfriend, they're both saints for, for staying with us um, when we're busy four nights out of the week. Um, sometimes it's hard to schedule in time to, uh, to get time to yourself even, which is yeah. hard. I was telling Brittany the other night I went to bed at, at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, which was pretty pathetic. <laughs> you, you know you're working hard when you go to bed earlier on the weekends <laughs> than the, the weekdays. Yeah. Yeah. Brittany, what about you? What's something that was painful that you actually had to not participate in because of the business? You know, I, I think I echo everything Kim said. For the first two years of running the company, neither one of us took a vacation. Um, so it was, you know, saying, yeah, I'd love to go to Italy for a week, but that's not realistic right now because I need to be here to help drive this business. And, you know, I'd love to I'd love to go spend some time with my family, but it's just, you know, something that's going to happen after this project is finished instead of before it's finished. So those are the types of sacrifices that are tough to make. But at the same time, if you talk to anyone from either of our families, they would tell you how proud they are of the business and everything that we've done in the company. And they're our biggest supporters. So, um, you know, they, they all definitely understand that just because we can't be there in person, that our hearts and minds are, are with them all the time. I mean, what you guys do just phenomenally well is you listen to your customers, you put ideas out there and vet them before, you know, fully spending the time and energy. What's something that you learned that was really important from listening to your customers? I think what's important in terms of listening is not giving people what necessarily you want, but giving them what they want. And I think I tell, you know, a lot of young entrepreneurs that it's it's one thing to have a great idea. It's another thing to have a great idea that someone will buy. Um, we have lots of great ideas, but if no one's willing to buy them, then maybe they're not so great. Um, so it's really just finding something that when you listen and people say yes, I will want to see that or yes, I want to use that. For us, it's really important to, whether it's social media or focus groups or friends and family, to constantly be listening to what people are saying, not necessarily what we think is best. What was something that a customer said that maybe surprised you that once you listened to it, you found that a lot of other people wanted the same thing? I think the example before about the uh, changing the direction of the die cut to make the CD stay in, that was something that, you know, we didn't think about because we don't have cars. We live in Manhattan. We don't drive. 
And, you know, the first couple people who told us, we thought, okay, you know, all right, you're right, maybe it would be great to have that. But when we started hearing it over and over again, uh, we realized that obviously we were wrong and our fans were right. And so we made the change. Got it. What's one thing the audience should do right now to start getting more sales and getting traction for their business? I think asking for them. We we like to call it the Zine Pack hustle. Uh, we are constantly emailing people, and you know it's about growing your networks and meeting new people and not being afraid to say, "Hey, I saw online that you have you know a big event coming up. Is anybody doing anything special for you? Can we make you a Zine Pack? Can we partner with you?" We are always asking for business, and you know when somebody says no to you, it doesn't mean no forever. It just means right then it's not a good fit. So we always say, you know, we'd love to come back and talk about this later or we would love for you to refer us to somebody that this could be a good fit for and never be afraid to ask somebody to help you get business. Yeah. I mean, I think a great point uh, that you made earlier too is, you know, when you talked about the first company was your husband's company, I think oftentimes we think and we look outside and we see, oh, this company would be good, this company would be good. But the those companies, our sales or whatever it is, is right in front of us for the people we know and the connections they have. And I think, I mean, that's just the light bulb went on for me is often we forget that, you know? So that was an important distinction. What are some of the tools and software and systems you use in your business that would be important? Actually, I'm so sorry, Jeremy. We're going to have to cut it here. Uh, we work in a co-working space, and one of the one of the things of working in a co-working space is reserving time, and our conference room time is up. So thank okay. you so much for having us today. It was thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much. You too. Bye-bye.